sugar is an interesting topic because it's really been demonized, I think, and may, maybe rightfully so. But um, I wanted to talk to you about sugar because it's actually been really front of mind for me lately. And when I say lately, I mean literally in the last 48 hours. I am I went away to a, a, a wedding um, and I remember they didn't have a lot of drinks. So I was opting for the sugar-free drinks, the things that say no added sugar in them. Like, mm. you know, I won't name the brands, but the ones that have zero and diet on them. Mm -hmm. First question is, is sugar the devil, as people have become to tell me? And also, if I'm drinking these zero drinks with mm. the diet and the zero on it, am I in the clear? <laughs> <laughs> This is a very complicated topic, and I, I think it's one that's also very contentious. Uh, and it's also one in which I've probably, my thinking has probably also evolved as, as, as the science, I think, has kind of evolved. So let's start with what I don't think anybody disputes. I don't think there's any, anybody out there thinking that high sugar foods are somehow nutritious, mm -hmm. right? That's not the question at hand. The question is, Calorie for calorie, is sugar somehow different from, let's just limit it to other sources of carbohydrates. So what is sugar? So I'm assuming when you're talking about sugar, you're talking about sucrose or high fructose corn syrup. Those would be the two dominant forms of sugar. But just to demystify it, sucrose, which is the white powder you would put in your coffee or tea, that's just one molecule of glucose and one molecule of fructose stuck together. That's table sugar. And if you contrast that with pure glucose, so like eating rice is basically pure glucose. It's going to be broken down into pure glucose. How different are they? Well, obviously the thing that differentiates them is the fructose. That's the thing that's different. Now it's true that fructose has a very different pathway to be metabolized. The body breaks down fructose in a very different way from the way it breaks down glucose. And by breaks down, I mean it gets energy from it. The whole purpose of eating is to make this thing called ATP. ATP is the currency of life. It's the currency by which energy is transmitted throughout the body. And the way we make ATP out of glucose is, I think I can probably say this, smarter than the way we make it out of fructose. Mm -hmm. The way we make it out of fructose has a problem, a slight problem. Now it doesn't really matter if you're not consuming a lot of fructose, but if you're consuming fructose in a liquid form, it has a real problem. I.e., if you are drinking sugar, there's a real problem. And the problem is this, when you make ATP out of fructose, you temporarily deplete the cell of energy to the point where more energy is needed. This is just a consequence of the speed at which we metabolize fructose. We do it quickly all the time in this way, but if you're eating an apple, for example, it's not really an issue because yes, the apple has fructose in it, but you know, it's not that it's not that much and you're eating it. So it's it's a piece of solid food with fiber and water that's taking a long time to exit your stomach. But if you drink a big glass of apple juice, well, I mean, first of all, that's much more fructose and it's liquid and it's just going straight out of your stomach and your liver is going to encounter it much sooner, as is your gut. And therefore, you're much more likely to want to eat more after. In other words, it creates more of a hunger response. Mm -hmm. So the real issue with sugar is <clears throat> calorie for calorie is it more damaging than just glucose? I actually think the answer to that question is probably not. Really? Yeah. But in the real world, is that possible? In other words, if I put you in a metabolic ward in a hospital where you had no control over what you ate other than me putting it in front of you, and I gave you two different diets, and one was higher in fructose than the other, I'm not convinced it would make that much of a difference. It's possible it would if we went to extremes. You know, maybe at a high enough fructose level, we might actually induce more fat production in the liver. We might actually create some fatty liver disease, maybe even drive insulin resistance. Um, but I might have to go pretty high on that. But 
the real problem is if I just let you have as much fructose and sugar as you wanted, you'd probably end up overeating in response to this energy depletion thing. So I don't sort of describe myself as like a hardcore sugar avoider. I mean, like we're here in London and I mean, I'm going to have dessert probably most nights, <laughs> right? I'm on vacation. Um, but I also acknowledge it that it's, you know, like not something that I want to be eating on a regular basis, you know, just added sugar all the time. Um, I don't drink sugar sweetened beverages. That's definitely a place where I draw a line. So I think there's something about liquid sugar that is more problematic than solid sugar. Um, so I'd rather eat my sugar and, um, at least have the benefit of it being more slowly absorbed mm -hmm. than drink it. Um, what about so, those diet drinks though? Yeah. So I look, I don't drink them personally very often. Um, and in part that's, I think due to a little bit of uncertainty, I think we still have about their impact on our metabolism through our gut. I think there's, I think there were emerging data that suggest that at least certain non-nutritive sweeteners, like things like, um, well, in the U.S. it's like NutraSweet. I think um, um, it's aspartame is the underlying agent or saccharin um, or sucralose. I think there's some, <clears throat> some suggestion that the effect that they have on the bacteria on your gut might be detrimental to your health. I, I think it's too soon to really say that. Mm. But my view is... Don't take the risk. Well, I don't need to, I suppose. Okay. Like, I'm, I'm re I love soda water. Like, I love carbonated water. So I'm just happy to drink that. But I'm sure once a month, I'm going to have a Diet Coke or something. But it's not a regular thing. But I, but I will say this. When I see people who are struggling, for example, with weight loss, mm -hmm. and they're drinking four Diet Cokes a day, one of the first things I'll do is have them stop completely and replace that with just water or sparkling water. Why? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I just empirically have seen, even though they're not getting any calories, that A, either it's impacting their eating behavior when they're not drinking the Coke, uh, or maybe it's having some negative impact on their gut that is that is impacting the way they're metabolizing their food. This, well, is, this is rather unscientific at sure. this point, but it's just empirically is something I've observed. Everyone cares about weight loss. It's such a big topic. Everyone wants to lose weight. I mean, as you clearly um, specify, people want to lose fat. Mm -hmm. They don't want to lose weight. People want to lose fat, which is something I heard you say. Um, what are the, the biggest misconceptions in your mind about weight loss? Because but I guess the narrative is to lose weight, you eat kind of you need, just need to eat less. That's kind of the, is that true? And what are the big misconceptions that you hear that we need to overcome? Yeah, I think that is largely true. I think that um, eating less uh, is the the more important step towards weight loss, um, and that the role of exercise is important, but less because of just the straight number of calories you burn. In other words, the increase in energy that you expend through exercise is usually offset by increased appetite. You use the word calories there. Yeah, contentious word sometimes. It shouldn't be. People people come on, have come on this podcast and told me that calories are like the concept of it is kind of like a lie, in the sense that they're not all even. Some cat, you know, a stick of celery has this many calories, and then when you boil it, it, has this many calories, and it's. Well, yeah, I think people tend to get a little off in the weeds on stuff that that might not matter that much. Um, yeah, it's certainly true that not all calories. Um, are absorbable the same way. And an mm -hmm. example of celery is a pretty extreme example because so much of celery is um, an insoluble fiber, right? So most of the mass of celery is water and insoluble fiber. There are virtually no calories in celery. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, it's not rocket science to figure out how many calories you're ingesting in a certain amount of food. And the truth of it is, if a person wants to lose weight, as you said, mm -hmm. what they really want to do is lose fat mass. There's, I've never met anybody out there who says, I want to have less muscle. So we want to have less fat. And therefore, we have to create an energy deficit. 
Um, now there are other elements to this that matter. So we don't, we just want to leave on the side that if you're sleep deprived, you're going to be very insulin resistant. It's, that's a much easier path to being overweight. Not sleeping. So, not sleeping. Right. So you, you can't correct a weight problem without correcting a sleep problem. What about a stress problem? Yep. That's even harder to correct because it's harder to measure. But yes, hypercortisolemia, high stress, makes it very difficult to lose weight. My, my partner said this to me this weekend. She was trying to figure out how in one stage of her life when she was, in her words, eating very, very healthy food, she says, I still wasn't losing weight. And she, she hypothesized in the car as we were driving that she thought it might be to do with her stress levels at that time in her life. And I, I remember thinking, oh, that's an interesting hypothesis. Yeah, so high stress, poor sleep, inactivity, all of those things will make it very difficult to lose weight, even in the presence of whatever perfect diet you're on. So those things have to be addressed, right? You have to be sleeping well. You have to be active because activity increases insulin sensitivity. And we want those muscles to be sensitive to insulin so that they quickly get glucose out of circulation. And also exercise increases the sensitivity of your brain to what are called satiety hormones, the hormones that tell you when to stop eating. Uh. So, and, and the difference between an exercising person and a non-exercising person uh, is that that non-exercising person has a blunted response to those hormones. So sometimes they're eating when they don't need to be eating. They're not getting the message that says, we have enough nutrition on board. Now, anybody can blow through that signal, but I would like to know that that signal is there. So when all of that is said, the question then becomes, how do you create an energy deficit? And basically, there are three ways to do it. There are three strategies to create an energy deficit. I describe them as CR, DR, TR. So that stands for <clears throat> calorie restriction, dietary restriction, and time restriction. So let's explain them. Okay. So calorie restriction is what it sounds like. Just eat less. Mm -hmm. um, that's the most direct way to go about doing this. So, you know, I got to eat 500 fewer calories a day and I'm going to have to track what I'm eating and count my macros and make that happen. Okay. That has the advantage of being the most direct way to do this. Um, but it has a disadvantage, frankly, of being harder to do. In some ways, you have to pay the most attention to it. It also has the advantage, by the way, of being pretty flexible and agnostic to what you eat. So, you know, if there are certain foods you like, there's no food that's off the table when you're doing calorie restriction, provided you're eating less overall. I've got a friend that said this to me, said, doesn't matter what you eat, just restrict the calories. I remember thinking that was strange advice because he was like, you can have Domino's pizza every day. You just, if you'll lose weight, if you have less calories. That's right. Now the problem is, He's absolutely right. But the problem is it can be very difficult to not suffer through calorie restriction if you're just eating crap. Because the body still, at the end of the day, keeps score with respect to nutrition. And the body still wants protein. The body still wants nutrients. The body still wants vitamins, minerals. So if you say, look, I'm going to eat 2,000 calories a day of Cadbury's, you might lose weight but you'll probably be in purgatory along the way. And you certainly won't be healthy. So we also wanna make sure we're not confusing health and weight here. Mm -hmm. Now we come to dietary restriction. Dietary restriction is what most people think of when they think of a diet. This means, as I describe it in the book, you know, pick your favorite boogeyman or two and just cut them out of the diet. So basically everybody that's arguing about their perfect diet is arguing about dietary restriction. So you want to take out carbs, you want to take out animal products, you want to take out everything but meat, you know, it's a carnivore diet, you want to go South Beach, paleo, Mediterranean, those are all just forms of dietary restriction. And generally speaking, the more restrictive you are in the diet, the less you will eat. So, I mean, it's, I don't think it's an accident that people who go on a carnivore diet typically lose a ton of weight. Uh, same is true with a ketogenic diet. I did it. Yeah. Uh, my scales, it was like this. This was the, the, it was a, it was a horizontal line, my weight, maybe a little bit up. And then I did keto for eight weeks and it was a vertical line down. Every time I hit those scales and the Bluetooth thing sent a, my weight to my phone, 
this vertical line down. I lost a stone in the space of those eight weeks, roughly. My girlfriend was like- A stone is 16 pounds? Something like that, yeah. Eight kilos-ish? 14 stone, what did I go from? 14 stone five to, 14 stone eight to 13 stone eight. Yeah, which I think, yeah. And were you hungry? Um, I couldn't sustain it easily. I'd say that because if we went to restaurants and stuff, I was always trying to get like taking corn out of it, like taking the wrap off a burrito and stuff and mm -hmm. um, whatever else. Um, was I hungry after I got past the first week? I wouldn't say I was hungry, no, but I also didn't find it sustainable because of, honestly, because of the nature of the modern world where it's so hard to find those things when you're living a very yeah. fast paced life. Hungry for some kind of nutrient, maybe. I think mm -hmm. there was some kind of psychological calling to go back to where, to my previous diet. And then I went to New York and that's when it fell down. So, and then did you regain the weight or what happened? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Just as fast as I lost it. Mm -hmm. I went from this keto diet to the New York diet. And it was so extreme how quickly I put that weight back on again. Um, just being honest. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, right? So I, I, again, it's a very extreme diet. And I think, you know, people are going to definitely lose 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 weight on it. And, and look, for some people, it's easy to sustain. For others, it's not. Um, but nevertheless, that's dietary restriction. And mm -hmm. again, I think the advantage of dietary restriction is you're not being restricted in the amount you eat. You're just being restricted in what you eat. And um, the challenge then really comes down to the craving of certain types of foods. So obviously in a ketogenic diet, you're going to really crave carbohydrates. Um, yeah. So the final strategy is time restriction. And people call this intermittent fasting as well. But it's basically saying, all right, how about I create a smaller window in which I eat? So I'm just going to allow myself to eat, you know, from noon to 8 p.m. or 2 p.m. to 8 p.m. or 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. And the narrower and narrower you make that window, the more likely it is that you will induce a significant caloric deficit and therefore you will lose weight. Do you, what do you think of fasting? Do you fast? Uh, not anymore, uh, at least not deliberately. Uh, I mean, I sometimes end up fasting just by the nature of whatever I'm doing. But um, again, fasting has a lot of advantages. It's conceptually the easiest by far. I think it is just the easiest to execute on. And because for most people, it's just easy to not eat for a period of time and yeah. then have no restriction when they are eating. Um, I think the biggest challenge of fasting comes down to protein intake. And protein is, in my view, obviously I write about this in the book, the most important macronutrient, the one we need to be paying the most attention to. And when you are <clears throat> intermittently fasting, it is very difficult to get the right amount of protein in and um, in the right doses. Mm -hmm. And therefore it's the most difficult to maintain muscle mass. And we always have to remember that, you know, if we're losing weight, we still want to be able to maintain muscle mass. We want to just lose fat mass and not lose both. If you love the Diary of a CEO brand and you watch this channel, please do me a huge favor, become part of the 15% of the viewers on this channel that have hit the subscribe button. It helps us tremendously and the bigger the channel gets, the bigger the guests.